true and it's taught very boldly. Here's another one from the book The Catholic Priest. I've got this in my own library. It's actually the manual that priests use when they train for the priesthood. And on page 78 and 79 it says, Seek where you will through heaven and earth, and you will find but one created being who can forgive the sinner, who can free him from the chains of hell. That extraordinary being is the priest, the Roman Catholic priest. Yes, beloved brethren, the priest raises his hand. He pronounces the word of absolution, and in an instant, quick as a flash of light, the chains of hell are burst asunder, and the sinner becomes a child of God. So great is the power of the priest that the judgments of heaven itself are subject to his decision. Now, folks, those are great words. God's got to do what the priest says. Heaven itself has to obey his words. That's powerful. And no other kingdom says those kinds of things. And folks, we could go on and on and on. Now, I want to say this too. This Thursday night, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to cover one of the most beautiful subjects in the Bible. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And on that night, when we talk about Jesus, we're going to learn in the Bible that God says when it comes to sin against God, you don't need anybody on this earth. you got a straight hotline to heaven. And the Bible says you can come boldly to the throne of grace and you can confess your sins to God and God alone. And He alone can forgive you of your sins. The Bible tells us there's only one mediator between God and man, and that is your Savior, Jesus Christ. You don't have to go to a pastor like myself. You don't have to go to a priest. You don't have to go to an idol made of wood or stone. you got a straight line right to God, your Father in heaven. And that truth is going to set you free, and it's going to fill you with joy. And again, if you've been very sincere and you've been confessing sins to a priest, God knows that. He accepts that. He understands that. But this next Thursday night, that's, you're going to be set free from that, all those things, and you're going to learn the joy of what God shares in His Word of confessing right to the Father in Jesus name. Now let me bring a balance out here too as well. Ladies and gentlemen, when we sin against each other, then we have the privilege to go to one another and forgive each other. Isn't that right? If I go to my brother down here and I would hurt him or say something against him, then I need to go to him and say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Yes, we can forgive each other that way. But when it comes to sin against God, only God can forgive those sins. We'll learn that beautiful truth this Thursday night. It will set you free and be a tremendous blessing. Okay, we had to cover that. The next area here is number eight. He would wear out a war against God's saints. And again, my friends, I don't like to talk about this, but we have to deal with it for a minute to see the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. All of you know, in fact, even by the Catholic Church itself, the most conservative figure given by the Church itself is that it put between 50 and 60 million martyrs to death during the Dark Ages. No other kingdom fits that description except Papal Rome. In fact, think about it, folks. Why are we sitting here tonight? Why did our pilgrim forefathers come to this great country? In fact, they set sail on a boat to a country they didn't even know existed. They didn't even know if the shores were here. Why did they do that in the 1600s? I'll tell you why. If you studied your history, the persecution in Holland by Papal Rome at this time was so severe and so many hundreds of thousands of people were being destroyed by the armies of Papal Rome that they finally had to flee the country and go to a place where they could find freedom of worship in a free land and with God and worship the way their conscience wanted them to do. That's why we're here in the United States of America tonight. In fact, as you study the history, ladies and gentlemen, it's incredible. I, I've gone over there. Most Protestant Christians put it as high as two to three hundred million martyrs that died throughout all those dark ages as they were burned alive at the stake, as they were eaten by wild animals. The history is bloody through Western Europe of Papal Rome and its atrocities during centuries after centuries of crusades and martyrdom and so on. Now, I said that for one reason because we have to take an honest look at history. But now I must say something else very, very important. Let's look at the next article here. A number of years ago, about 1994, all of a sudden you saw a lot of articles coming out in the papers where it says the Pope urges forgiveness for centuries of wrong. And I want to bring this out very openly tonight. In the year 1994, the Pope issued a letter to all Christian churches. And in that letter that he issued, it's a 71-page letter, it was uh, issued November 15, 1994, he asked the religious community, all Christians, to forgive the Catholic Church and the kingdom of papal Rome for all that it had done during the Dark Ages. And it basically says this, the Pope says the Roman Catholic Church must mark the year 2000 by acknowledging its members' sins, including intolerance in the name of religion and complacency in human rights crimes. As the second uh, millennium, let's, we'll continue here, here it goes, uh, 
Anyway, it says as the second millennium draws on, uh, it should more fully acknowledge its member sins and things like this. But the letter then goes on to acknowledge things like the Spanish Inquisition, the Crusades, the martyrs that died all throughout the centuries and so on. And, and he simply says, forgive us for all these things that we did and all the times that we didn't act in a Christ-like way. So here's what I wanna say tonight. If the Pope has asked in behalf of the kingdom of Papal Rome that we forgive them for all those things that they did wrong and all the people they martyred, then ladies and gentlemen, we have the privilege as brothers and sisters to forgive each other. Isn't that right? As I just mentioned. So how many tonight are willing to say yes, we forgive you, we put it behind it. Can you say amen to that tonight? Let me see your hands here tonight. Come on, do you forgive them? Some of you don't have your hands raised. You won't go to heaven if you don't have your hands raised. Let me ask the question again. <laughs> I, I want you all to go to heaven. I really do. Are you willing to say to papal Rome, for all those years of martyrdom, for all those people you slew, if you've asked us to forgive you, then as brother to sister, we have the privilege to do that. God says, forgive and you shall be forgiven. How many are willing tonight to forgive papal Rome for doing that? Let me see your hands again. All right, very, very good. I hope most of your hands up. If you don't, you need to talk to God. <laughs> okay. But the reason I want to bring this out, folks, is it's very important we forgive. And when we forgive, you forget. Isn't that right? You put it behind you. And I thank God that the Pope was man enough and godly enough to ask forgiveness. I think that's a very, very good thing that he did. And I thank God for it. And so I only brought this out tonight to show the fulfillment of the prophecy. We had to look at that honestly. But now they're not doing that anymore. That's in the past. It's over and so on. Let's forgive and let's forget and continue to love and grow in the truth of Jesus Christ. All right, so we brought that up. Let's go to the next one. It would think to change times and laws. Boy, this one blew my mind. Because I had studied catechism in preparation, you know, for First Communion, things like this. And in the catechism, if you've ever read it, you see some interesting things. First of all, let me read you a couple quotes that might surprise you. This is again from the Ferrari's Ecclesiastical Dictionary. I like to use that because that's an official source. It says, the Pope is of so great authority and power that he can modify or change or interpret even divine laws. The Pope can modify divine law since his power is not of man. So very openly they say, yeah, we, we can change law. It goes on to say the power is not of man but of God. And he acts as a vicegerent of God upon earth with most ample power of binding and loosing the sheep. There's many, many statements you'll find in Catholic books that teach this. But now I'm going to show you something that's literally going to blow your mind. I've got my Can uh, Converse Catechism of Catholic Doctrine. I've got a brand new copy right here tonight. And you can pick this up in Catholic bookstores. That's what you go through before you take your first communion. And there's a section here on the law of God. And I want to read you something interesting. It begins on page 48 here. It's the very page you see written right there. This is an actual copy of that. In fact, I can read it off the screen here for you too. You can see it. It says, what is the second commandment? This is this point right over here. It goes on to say, the second commandment is, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Now, wait a minute. Hold everything. Those of you that have read your Bibles, can you tell me what is the second commandment in the Bible? Thou shalt not make, that's right, unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above the earth beneath. Thou shalt not bow down thy suit to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. You say, well, what happened? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the only kingdom and the only power in the world that is thought to change God's law. Because the second commandment in the Bible, you'll find in the catechism, is completely taken out. And I don't care what Catholic catechism you... you I've got about 70 Catholic catechisms in my library at home. All of them, the second commandment is completely gone. And the reason is obvious, of course, because of the idols and the images and Mary and Jude and, you know, all the different saints and so on, and, and the, the praying to these idols and so on. This is why that one is completely taken out of God's law in the catechism. And you know what's done then? Let me read on here as I go to 9 and 10. It goes on to say here in the ninth commandment, it says, what is the eighth, or the ninth commandment? Let me just find it here real quick. Or excuse me, what is the tenth commandment? It says, the 10th commandment is, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. You know what the ninth commandment is? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. No, it's not. No, it's not. In order to get 10 commandments, because the one is thrown out, they split the 10th one in two. And now number nine says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. And number 10 says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there is no power in the history of the world that has thought to change God's law. Only the kingdom of papal Rome. And by the way, there's more, but I can't tell you tonight or it would blow you away. I'll tell you in a future night, okay? But there's even more than that. We'll cover that in a future night. So we see the fulfillment of that. Well, let's continue on. We got one last identifying part. What's our time looking at? Oh, we got lots of time. We're doing good here. 
The tenth point says it's going to rule for a time, times half a time, that's three and a half years, or 1260 days, or prophetic years. You know, folks, something about God, He never misses. When God does something, He does it so clear, He does it so airtight, so powerfully, there is absolutely the sure word of prophecy. If this has been sure so far, say amen. I mean, you just can't miss this. It's crystal clear. But this last part is the most dramatic. Let's go back to this. When did papal Rome first be set on the throne? When did it first rule in Rome? The year was 538 AD. We established that. We've established the principle I've given you each day for a year. And we continue on. Let's get a little bit of history book here. This is from the History of the Christian Church, Volume 3, page 327. It says, Villages ascended the papal chair in 538 AD under the military protection of Belisarius. All right? And by the way, you can go home and look this up at any history book. That's when it took place in 538. That's when the Pope was seated on the throne. That's when it began to rule in Rome. God says it's going to rule for 1260 years. And ladies and gentlemen, to the very year the prophecy was fulfilled. In fact, someone do some arithmetic for me. Take this year, 538, attested in all history books. It's a matter of history. Add to it 1,260 years, and tell me what year are you going to come to? You got it, 1798. What happened in Europe in 1798? There was a revolution going on. What was it called? The French Revolution. That's exactly right. And folks, in 1798, he, General Berthier, who was working for Napoleon, made his entrance into Rome. He abolished the papal government and established a secular one. That comes from the Encyclopedia of American History, 1941 edition. And that's, again, a matter of history. You see, they went into Rome and they literally confiscated all the property of the church. They declared a republic. They said the Pope will never, ever exist in Rome again. In fact, they took the Pope off the throne and they took him into France where he died in exile and for many years there wasn't even a pope in Rome. In fact, folks, it was literally not until 1929 when Mussolini set it up again as a political state that it had that same power once again that it had before. This was the deadly wound that the Bible refers to, and ladies and gentlemen, it was exactly 1260 years. It comes to the throne in 538, Emperor Justinian lets it happen, and the Bishop of Rome is placed there, take 1260 years, goes straight to 1798, Pope Pius VI is imprisoned by Napoleon, taken to France, dies in exile, everything exactly as God said it would happen in Bible prophecy. Now, folks, that's not a mistake. Can you say amen? That is not a mistake. Only God could take that step by step by step by step and perfectly see it come to pass. That's awesome, and that's the sure word of prophecy. Okay, now you say, Leo, what does all this have to do with the beast of Revelation 13? Let's go back there now. Revelation chapter 13. And as you turn to Revelation 13, I'll wrap it up here. I've got exactly six minutes. I can do it. In Revelation chapter 13, notice the interesting parallels. Revelation chapter 13. As you go through this chapter, I'm going to do this quickly now. We'll do more tomorrow night. But notice the exact same parallels between this beast of Revelation 13 and what we just read in the book of Daniel about this little horn. It says in verse 5, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies just like the little horn in Daniel did. It does the exact same thing. It goes on in verse 5 and says, And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Tell me, how many days are in forty-two months? Exactly, 1260. He rules the exact same period of time. Look at verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Folks, it persecuted and warred against God's saints, just like the little horn did. Verse 8, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, just like the little horn. Folks, the beast of Revelation 13, the one that God says don't worship, don't worship its image, don't receive the mark of the beast, is exactly the same kingdom and power as the little horn of Daniel 7. It is the papal Roman Empire. Therefore, in Bible prophecy, 23 times in the book of Revelation, God tells us, don't worship this beast, don't worship the image of this beast, and for sure don't receive the mark from this beast, speaking of the papal Roman Empire. Now that is fascinating, and that's incredible. But let's take it a step farther as I wrap it up tonight, because I want you to think a little bit. Did you notice something interesting about the beast of Revelation 13? It's a composite beast. Did you notice, and many of you probably picked this up, the beast of Revelation 13 is actually made up of those four other beasts we just studied in Daniel? Look at it carefully. First of all, the beast of Revelation 13, representing this papal Roman empire, it has the head of the lion, which is Babylon. Secondly, that beast has the feet of this bear, which is Medo-Persia. Thirdly, it has the body of the leopard, which was Greece. And fourthly, it has the ten horns from this fourth beast, which was Rome. 
Why does God represent the beast of Revelation 13, the papal Roman Empire, why does he represent it as being made up of these four other pagan kingdoms? Did you ever wonder about that? Not only that, look at Revelation 13, verse 2. There's something else here I want you to ponder. Revelation 13, verse 2 says, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, his feet were as the feet of a bear, his mouth was the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Ladies and gentlemen, who is the dragon that is behind the beast of Revelation 13? Who is that dragon? Not only that, look at verse 18. Verse 18 goes on to say, Here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is 603 score and 6. That's 666. Who is this man behind the beast whose number is 666? Well, folks, I'd love to tell you the answers to all those questions, but our time's up, so you'll have to wait till tomorrow night. <laughs> but I promise you, tomorrow night, you're going to get the answers to all those questions as we see the big picture. Now, let me say this as I close. You know, often after this seminar, our Catholic friends that are here are, are very excited. And uh, it, it's neat as a Catholic to see the uh, kingdom of papal Rome in Bible prophecy. That, that's pretty awesome. And Catholics are always happy and they, they enjoy this and they, this, this is really cool. Even though it did some bad things in the past, you know, this, this is really neat to see papal Rome in Bible prophecy. And you know what I found out? I found out that sometimes the Protestants feel a little bit left out. Yeah. In fact, I found sometimes the Protestants feel a little bit smug. Sometimes Protestants say, well, Leo, this doesn't affect me. I don't worship the beast. This has nothing to do with me. It's not going to affect me at all. Protestants, I'm going to ask you a question. I don't care if you're Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Assemblies of God, Adventist, Episcopalian, you name it. You may not be worshiping the beast. That may be true. But here's the question I want to pose to you. Could you be worshiping the image of the beast. You better believe it. I want all you Protestants here tonight to know one thing. You are far more involved in this issue than any Catholic ever could be. Catholics are way ahead of Protestants as far as getting in trouble in this one, believe me. Now you may not be a Catholic, you may not be a Protestant, you may not believe in the Bible, you may not go to church. You may say, Leo, I don't really give a care. I don't know what I believe. I want you to know you're more involved than Catholics and Protestants all put together. You might be receiving the mark of the beast and not even know it. What does verse 3 say? Look at it one more time. Revelation 13, verse 3. I want you to take this to heart tonight. Revelation 13, verse 3 says, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And how much, my friends? The Bible says all the world wondered or followed after the beast. That means very easily, as you sit here tonight, you could be following and wondering after the beast and not even know it. You could be sitting here tonight worshiping the image of the beast and not even know it. Beloved, that's why we've got to know the truth. And believe me, it affects every one of us here tonight. Now, I want to say one other thing as I close. Do you know, folks, that what I presented here tonight, every single Christian church in this city preached until 30, 40 years ago? That's it's an absolute fact. I don't care what denomination you're from here tonight. Every single Christian church in this city preached what I preached here word for word up to 30, 40 years ago. But you don't hear it anymore. Let's take, for an example, Lutherans, one of my favorite churches, precious people. Martin Luther is one of my heroes. I've got his entire library at home. I have read it three times. And I have found in Martin Luther's library 31 sermons, word for word, what I presented here tonight. 31 sermons. But you know what? You never hear it in a Lutheran church anymore. Isn't that right? I'll tell you, that raised a big old flag in my mind. Methodist. The founder of your church is John Wesley. I've got his entire works in my home. It's 23 volumes. I have read that three times, front to back. I have found 11 sermons in John Wesley, the great founder of the Methodist Church. I have found 11 sermons, word for word. And every Methodist preacher in this town preached that until 30 years ago or 40 years ago. You never hear it anymore. That would raise a big old flag in my mind. You think something's going on? What about Pentecostals? One of my favorite churches. 
And I appreciate so much about how they worship and their love for Bible study and so on. And the amazing thing is, the Pentecostal movement was born out of the holiness movement in the 1800s, and the whole thing that fueled that was these very prophecies we're studying here. And all of the old Pentecostal preachers, including some of the famous ones like Oral Roberts and so on, all those men used to preach word for word what I'm preaching here tonight. But you seldom hear it in a Pentecostal church anymore. Seldom. Presbyterians. Founder of your church was Calvin. I've got sermon after sermon in my library of Calvin preaching exactly, but you never hear it in the, Pres uh, in the Presbyterian church anymore. You think something's going on, folks? Doesn't that just raise a big old flag in your mind? Why is it that everybody preached this, but now nobody is? Can I say something else to really get you stimulated? What are you hearing instead? I'll tell you what you're hearing. You're hearing, hey, we're all going to be secretly raptured. And after the rapture, that's when the tribulation's going to come. And during that tribulation, that's when the Antichrist beast is going to come. And you're not even going to be here because you're going to be gone. So don't worry about the beast. Don't worry about worshiping the beast. Don't worry about the image of the beast or the mark of the beast. You're not even going to be here. You're going to be gone. Isn't that sweet? Sweet, but deadly. Deadly, folks. I want you to know that every one of us are involved in this tonight. And God, in His desperate love, has one great desire. And that is, in the last days, we're not following anything to do with Antichrist, but that we're following one person, and that is our Savior, Jesus Christ. I urge you, don't miss tomorrow night. As we get the big picture, how we're all involved, and the best part tomorrow night, we're going to learn how we can make a choice to be on Jesus' side and never on Antichrist's side. Let's stand together as we close in prayer. Let's pray. Our loving Father in heaven, tonight we thank you for the sure word of prophecy. We thank you that we don't have to guess or speculate, but that your word is true and clear and concise. Tonight, Lord, you've revealed a, a great truth to us. For some of us, it's been a little bit sensitive, but we want to see that this is the revelation of Jesus. This is the Bible book that you said you're blessed if you read and study. We know, Lord, you send this to us because in these last days there's a lot of error and deceptions and false teachings. There's things that we may not even be aware of. And so, Lord, even though the truth sometimes hurts a little bit, we thank you for it. And I pray that as we see it bathe in your love tonight, that at last when Jesus comes, we will make a covenant that we don't want to follow anything that is of Antichrist, but we only want to follow that which is of Jesus Christ. And so continue, God, to guide us by your Holy Spirit into all truth. May we, as we come together again tomorrow night, be able to see how each one of us fit into this picture. And most of all, may we see how we can each make eternal decisions to be saved and to be on your side in these final moments of earth's history. So, Lord, bless your people as they go home. And I pray if there's anything that I have not made clear, I ask that your sweet spirit now would as each person goes home and continues to study. Bring us back tomorrow. We love you and thank you for these blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.